Welcome back to Black Cat Crypto Club. We have light at the end of the tunnel, guys. We, we've, we're starting to see some good news coming out. Um, a lot of positive things about Bitcoin and markets that are, are starting to emerge after weeks of bad news and doom and gloom and red in the markets. So stick around to the end of this video. There's gonna be some major good news towards the end of the video. Uh, but before we get into all of that, guys, again, I am spotlighting Olive Branch Micro Sanctuary this month. These guys are so small, guys. Look at this. They've got 54 followers on Facebook. Uh, Friday, that was at 51. If you want to help these guys out, if you don't have any money to donate, just go over to their Facebook, hit this like button and help them out that way. That gives them a little bit more exposure for, for their sanctuary and really helps them out, even just doing that for something this small. Now, again, with them being this small, just a dollar, a few dollars really goes a long ways to help these guys. And in the description of my video, I have a link to this. This is their link tree, again, uh, you can go and you can donate to their medical debt fundraiser. They've got Instagram, Facebook. Go over and like them on Instagram and Facebook. That also helps them out. They've got uh, a Amazon and Chewy wish list that you can donate to them through that. Uh, and then they've got PayPal, Venmo here, and they've got a TikTok. But guys, again, these guys, even though they're so small, they are a registered 501c nonprofit organization. So anything you donate to them is also a win for you guys because you can write that off on your taxes. So again, such a small sanctuary. If anything else, just go over to them on Facebook, hit that like button for them and, and follow them. You know, that helps them gain a lot more exposure and helps them out a lot. Donating a few dollars to them really, really helps them. So go over and do that. Now, I want to get into one thing before we really start getting into the news. The past week or so, I've done a few videos on Peter Schiff, and I am glad to be kind of done with those videos. It's not really the video I like to make, uh, but... It was fun and interesting. It was fun to interact with Peter Schiff, with him stopping by the channel, making some comments. Uh, but the last, the day I did my last video on Peter Schiff, he went into a debate for, on Zero Hedge against Anthony Pompliano. No, not Anthony Pompliano, Anthony Scaramucci and Eric Voorhees and debated Bitcoin versus gold, which seems to be the only way he remains relevant is if he talks about Bitcoin. But I want to show you guys a clip of one of the things he said in that debate. When you say Bitcoin's a success, all it's succeeded in doing is going up in price. <laughs> the only thing Bitcoin's done, it's a whole new level of cope for Peter. Uh, and it, it was funny watching this debate. He quickly, right after he said that, he knew, <laughs> oh, I just said something that was supposed to be negative about Bitcoin that was really just not very logical uh, and look, made Bitcoin look amazing because the only thing good it's done is go up in price. But he stumbled over himself after that and insisted that he needed to make his point. And what he did was he went on the offensive and things got even worse. He, he actually called, in other words, he called the uh, Bitcoiners, he said Bitcoiners are just a bunch of losers that live at home with their parents. And all I've really got to say about that is if he thinks that, hang on, mom, Keep it down. I'm trying to make a video in here. Gosh. 
<laughs> Sorry. Anyways, that's the big difference between me and Peter, honestly. You know, I am all about empowering the the underdogs, empowering the working class. Um, and Peter just seems to want to sit on his throne with his nice golden crown and be King Schiff. And, you know, it's pretty shameful, if I'm completely honest, to go and attack people. You know, there's more and more people that are having to live at home with their families because ordinary people making ordinary, working ordinary jobs can't afford even housing anymore. And so shame on you, Peter, for go attacking these people for an economic, broken economic system that you yourself are happy to participate in because you're not that. You're, you can sit on your throne, Peter. So sit on your throne. You know, the, the guillotine will be coming for you sooner than you think, Pete. Okay. So the next thing I want to get into is over here on NBC, we've got this news that broke the same day as the FOMC meeting, guys. And if you remember, I covered the FOMC meeting live and it was such a huge disappointment to me that no one talked about the banking system. Not one single journalist talked about the banking system. And it was almost like they were told they couldn't bring that up. I mean, they, after Chair Powell came out and said they were not going to rate hikes, they didn't see their next, next uh, move as being a rate hike, which means their next move is going to be a rate cut. He said that, and there were five or six journalists that completely almost disregarded it and completely kept hounding him about rate hikes. And he, he had to fight him off about the rate hike thing. And then the, the very last question was something completely irrelevant. Uh, it was all about diversity on the board of, Fed, uh, of the Federal Reserve, which is fine if you want to talk about that when open seats are coming available in the Fed. Talk away about diversity in the Fed. But at this Fed meeting, when we just saw a bank failure the previous Friday, like three days before, come on. Anyways, this is breaking news that came out that same day. It said why hundreds of U.S. banks may be at risk for failure. Now, I want to scroll down and just read this, this one little bit. It says consulting firm Claros Group analyzed about 4,000 U.S. banks and found 282 banks face the dual threat of commercial real estate loans and potential losses tied to higher interest rates. So it's like I've been saying this last month, we saw a jump in commercial uh, real estate loan failure or foreclosure, and we saw that number jump 117% in March. So we have this major thing where banks are struggling with commercial loans, commercial real estate loans, but they're also upside down in bonds and treasury bills. So... <laughs> You know, with with interest being so high, they've they're actually under underwater on a lot of these investments that they've invested into bonds and treasury bills. Now, it's interesting because just the same day as the FOMC, and this might be the reason the FOMC didn't want to talk about it, didn't think that it was necessary to talk about the banking system, is that they are actually bailing out the banks as we speak. This broke just this, the very same day. Now, this is 
a tentative schedule for treasury buyback options. So the Fed's sister agency, the treasury, is buying back these bonds and treasury bills. So this is absolutely a, a bank bailout, and this is going to keep banks from, from going under, no doubt about it. But what it does is it, it injects liquidity into the system. It's as good as printing money. This is just printing money specifically for the bailout of the banks, and it's going to have an inflative consequence. So being in something like Bitcoin is definitely going to be where you're going to want to be. Now, I just want to read this from Marty Party here over on X. It says the U.S. Treasury is launching its first buyback program since 2002, scheduled to start on May 29th, 2024. The program is designed to improve liquidity in the Treasury market and is expected to run through July of 2024. During this period, the Treasury plans to hold weekly liquidity support buybacks of up to $2 billion per operation, meaning every bank can sell back Treasury bills worth $2 billion per bank. A lot of liquidity coming to save these banks. With up to 500 million allocated for tips, treasury inflation protected securities, this initiative aims to ensure the treasury market remains the deepest and most liquid in the world, addressing concerns about market functioning and resilience. So this is aimed to solve bank failures. And you know, that's exactly, exactly what he says. He says, in my opinion, this is a bank bailout. And that's absolutely 100% what it is. This is a bank bailout. Uh, it's an injection of liquidity into the banking system. And it's absolutely going to inflate the dollar. So get out of fiat. They're manipulating the money supply again. And it's... What's what's really sad is it's going to affect the lower class again disproportionately because the lower and middle classes aren't allocated to assets like the upper class and the rich are. So inflation always hits the lower and middle classes harder because of that. The next thing I'm jumping over to this from Yahoo Finance, but if you remember at the FOMC meeting, Fed Pal mentioned that they wouldn't be cutting rates. One of the things that they would have to see to cut rates would be a weakening in the job market. Now, two days after the Fed meeting, this, uh, the JOLTS report, the job opening uh, report came out and it says April jobs reports showing, shows hiring wage growth slow as unemployment in unexpectedly jumps. So we've seen a big jump in unemployment and hiring and wages are slowing down. And that is exactly what Chair Pal said he needed before he would cut rates. So they want to they want to cut rates, guys, not only for the election, but also bailing out these banks that are really struggling, they want to cut rates to help out, help relieve that stress on the banking system. Because again, guys, if banks start failing, consumer confidence in banking starts going down and they start losing the power that they hold. So again, you know, this is exactly what he was saying. I don't know if he, I mean, it's almost like he knew that the, this report, what it was going to show this month, uh, but he got what he asked for. And now it seems like this is much more evidence that they are going to, to cut rates uh, sooner than later. Interesting guys, because I watched a bunch of podcasts, a lot of news, and I was very much in the minority 
in saying that I, I was saying that the Fed was going to come out either dovish or they were going to tiptoe around, uh, but they were not going to come out hawkish. And everybody else that I was watching was saying that the Fed was bound to come out hawkish because inflation had started to curve back up. And I even saw some people saying that they were expecting rate hikes on Wednesday. And I, I just could not get that through my head because the banks are failing again, guys. They've got to inject liquidity and money into the system. There was no way that Pal was coming out hawkish and putting more stress on that banking system. But, you know, and that's exactly what he did. He came out very dovish, said that they weren't hiking rates, that they weren't going to hike rates, and that their next move would be a rate cut. But I was definitely in the minority there saying that. Now, the next thing, we're jumping over to this. This is, let me move this over for you. This is the Federal Reserve Economic Data website. And this is the percent change from year, a year ago uh, in M2. Now, if you don't know what M2 is, M2 is the entire complete money supply. So let me pull this back over so you can see exactly what we're doing right now. You can see uh, back here in 2020, this, this big uh, incline in money supply was when the, the Federal Reserve and the federal government printed a bunch of money. They stimulated, they sent out checks to every American during COVID. So this was COVID. We saw a, a huge increase in money supply, and then it kind of continued up all the way until uh, 2021, and it started coming down after that, leveled out. And then here is, this is right when the uh, Federal Reserve started raking or hiking rates. And this was 2022, they started hiking rates, and you can see that the money supply just fell and fell and fell. In 20, right around 2023, we went negative on money supply growth. And you can see right here, this very last little dot, guys, we have finally gone positive again. We've in, this has been about a year and a half that we've been negative on money supply and we are starting to finally go positive again. So what does this mean? This is a sign that money, uh, liquidity is coming back into the markets. Money supply is increasing, which usually means that, uh, you know, jumping back over to this, this, this is why inflation is going back up because liquidity and, and money supply is rising again. So it's good for markets. It's bad for inflation. Uh, but they've, they absolutely want this at this time because if, if they keep it negative, those, those banks are going to fail again, guys. And, uh, we've seen that the economy is weakening, weakening the jobs market is weakening. And so if they don't want to crash the economy, this is what has to happen. They've got to inject liquidity into the system. They've got to print money. And they, you know, inflation be damned at this point, I think. Um, now, again, will we see inflation come down? It's possible. Um, you know, like I said in a previous video, in the 80s, when we had this kind of situation, they manipulated the numbers. They took housing out of CPI, out of needs-based inflation, and they manipulated those numbers. So do we see another situation where they do that again and, and inflation comes down despite them uh, forcing liquidity into the market and saving the economy? It's possible. Uh, <laughs> but that doesn't mean inflation won't be there. 
So again, guys, get out of fiat. You've got to get in something that you're protected against this crazy, crazy monetary policy, monetary, uh, you know, issuance that our government does. Now I want to jump over this. <laughs> This just broke out last week as well, this last Friday, I believe. I'm going to show you guys a clip of, uh, this is the chief economic advisor for the country. This is the chief economic advisor for the White House right now, as we speak. So I just want you guys to listen to this, success, all of uh, this clip right here. The U.S. government can't go bankrupt because we can print our own money. It obviously begs the question, why exactly are we borrowing in a currency that we print ourselves? I'm waiting for someone to stand up and say, why do we borrow our own currency in the first place? Like you said, they print the dollar. So why, why does the government even borrow? Well, um, the, uh, so the, I mean, again, some of this stuff gets some of the language that the MM, some of the language and concepts are just confusing. I mean, the government definitely prints money. It's confusing. And it definitely lends that money, which is why uh, the government definitely prints money and then it lends that money by, uh, by selling bonds. Uh, is that what they do? <laughs> they, they, um, they, yeah, they, they, um, they sell bonds. Yeah, they sell bonds. Right, since they sell bonds and people buy the bonds and lend them the money. Yeah, so a lot of times, a lot of times, at least to my ear with, with MMT, the, the language and the concepts can be kind of unnecessarily confusing, but there is no question that the government prints money and then it uses that money to, um, uh, 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 so, um, yeah, I, I guess I'm just, I, don't, I can't really talk, I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't know what they're talking about, like, because it's like the government clearly prints money, it does it all the time, and it clearly borrows, otherwise we wouldn't be having this debt and deficit conversation. So I don't think there's anything confusing there. Wow, wow. You know, he, he said it was confusing twice, and obviously it's confusing for him. He was stumbling all over himself, and then at the very end he's like, eh, it's not confusing at all. You know, we print money and then we borrow money and clearly we print money. Uh, but guys, this just, this is a strong testament to me as, as why I'm in Bitcoin because man, I would take a trustless, uh, a trustless computer code based system over that any day. You know, that kind of confusion, that is the top economic advisor for the country. And he can't even comprehend the system that he embraces. It's, it's, uh, man, it's, uh, wild, 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 wild. Now on with the more positive news outside of the government. Uh, let's get into this. This just broke Friday as well. Uh, this is Grayscale Bitcoin Trust. Uh, the GBTC ETF, Bitcoin ETF, records its first inflow of $63 million, marking a turnaround after $17.5 billion outflows since January. Guys, this is huge. Um, because I've, I've talked extensively in, in past videos about GBTC having this massive head start in the ETF space, but they kept their rates so high that people, once it became an ETF, they could finally sell that and get out. And they, they have had 78 straight days of selling in GBTC until Friday, they finally had their first inflow. So if, if GBTC stops selling, guys, that is huge. That's the only thing, as far as ETFs, that has been keeping the market more and more suppressed. So 
that's huge. We're also going to go back over to here to another article. Uh, this is Cointelegraph. It says BlackRock sees sovereign wealth funds and pensions coming to Bitcoin ETFs. Now, I want to scroll down to, to read this, just this little blurb out of this article. It says, don't be fooled by the first break in inflows into spot Bitcoin exchange traded funds ETFs after 71 straight days. The first lull, the, uh, the current lull is likely to be followed by a new wave from a different type of investor, said Robert Michnik, head of the digital assets at BlackRock the world's largest asset management company. Now, this is exactly what I've said in the past, in past videos as well, guys, is that the ETF, the ETFs for Bitcoin, money coming into that is going to come in waves. You know, we've had this first wave, which has largely been seen as just retail, but we have institutions and bankings and uh, hedge funds, all of these things coming in a larger wave. The thing is, is that large, big money moves slower. They've got to pass everything through uh, their board. They've got to, you know, have votes. Large money just moves slower and more calculated. So, Moving or going back to this article, it says the coming months could see a financial see financial institutions such as sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, and endowments start to trade in the spot ETFs. Michnik said in the interview. So this this is one of uh, BlackRock's. Uh, it's the head of digital assets for BlackRock is saying this, and. It's what I've been saying for, for quite a while, guys, is that we have large corporations, big money that are wanting to come into these ETFs. They're finally getting educated on this asset and they are preparing to come in, but it's going to come in waves. And I think, I think Mitch Nick in this article is, is correct. You know, this lull is just that wave, that wave structure. You know, we've had that first wave come in. We're kind of having a, a lull in those ETFs right now until Friday. Friday was a huge inflow into the ETFs and we're probably starting to see this next wave of money coming into those ETFs. So huge news for Bitcoin. I think um, possibly we're at the end of that dark tunnel that we've been in for the last month. And guys, it's sad uh, because I know personally there are people that I, I personally know that watch this channel and they've, you know, they, I think one in particular uh, bought in around 60,000, enjoyed that entire ride up to 73, wherever we hit. And then watched it all come back down and, and ended up selling at 70 or uh, 58, 57 or 58 guys. And guys, it, it, man, it pains me to see this happen to people that I know because I, with this channel, I do my best to show you guys. I've, I've shown you that during these uptrends, these bull markets, there are 30% corrections and don't get fudded out. Don't get shaken out over these minor corrections during this bull run. And I know for a fact that people have have got shaken out. Um, and it'd be you know it, they're it's completely backwards because they they buy, you know, they know <laughs> they know that you're supposed to buy low, sell high. But their psychology, human psychology never changes. And it's sad to see because psychology and their mo their emotions get the best of them. They end up FOMOing in towards the top of a cycle and they sell at the bottom. They get fudded out and shaken out because of all the fear. <laughs> and it'd be funny if it wasn't so sad. 
because these people that have just sold at the at the bottom here when we were sub sixty thousand dollars are likely never to see those prices again and they'll sit they'll sit back and they'll go okay well it's a volatile asset i'll wait until it, it it's bound to dip back down to where i sold that so then i'll just get in during that and that's honestly it could it could turn around and go back down to those prices uh short term like i said we're trading sideways at this point but there's a good chance that they will never get that chance again, and they will stay out this entire crypto bull market when they could have had immense gains. So it's sad, but that's why I try and hammer into these videos, have a plan, have a plan, have a plan, know that it's volatile, it's gonna correct 30% several times as we're going up. So have a plan, learn about Bitcoin, get that conviction, know what it does, know why it's so important. If this is just a money thing for you, your emotions are going to get the best of you. And it's, it's so sad to see, guys. <laughs> I, you know, hopefully the rest of you guys have your bags packed and are ready for the next leg up uh, because we're going to Mars, guys, and we're getting t-shirts for everyone. So I wanna jump over here to TradeView um, and just show you guys a few things in the chart. You know, we had this, this is where we broke down below 60,000, but we've had that V-shaped recovery. So quickly got back to, to normal. Again, we're just at this point, we're just seeing this sideways action. But let me show you a few things in the chart, guys. Um, down here, this very bottom, this purple line, this is the RSI, the Relative Strength Index. And as you can see, we dipped right here almost all the way down to this 30, uh, 30 mark on the RSI. And what this means is that it is oversold. So we are bound to bounce off that, which we have seen it with this V-shaped recovery. We've seen the RSI bounce off that. Now, guys, look at this. This is on the daily. And if we scroll all the way out, we have not seen the RSI down at those levels since right here. This was in September. And prices were at 24,915. The last time we were at that level in the RSI, we were at 24,900. And then we went on to do this. Okay. So are we setting up for that next leg up? It's very, very possible according to the RSI. The, RS, uh, the stochastic RSI are these top lines. And let me kind of zoom into that a little bit better. It's very bullish when the blue line crosses above the orange line in the, in the stochastic RSI, RSI. And we are seeing that. So again, guys, all of these indicators are also saying that we are going higher. Now, do we trade sideways for a few few more weeks, few more months? It's possible, uh, but all the indicators are showing that we are set up for that next leg up any time now. So on top of all the good news, the charts are looking extremely bullish. Um, so again, guys, I hope you didn't get get shaken out. I know some did, without a doubt, but I hope your bags are packed. Every bit that we are in this sideways and downward motion is very much a blessing for all of you guys that are dollar cost averaging into this market. This has been a 
tremendous buying opportunity for all of you that are that continue to to buy in every check uh every check that you get every paycheck so congratulations cheers to that let's get ready for this next leg up whenever it may come and condolences to all the people that got shaken out of their positions down it's 57,000 58,000 I I just don't know if we see that again. Anyways, guys, I will see you in the next video. Remember, please, to go over and help out Olive Branch Micro Sanctuary. Go over and like them on Facebook, on Instagram, and throw them a few dollars if you can spare it. I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye.